also the endocrine system. However, uh, because of the um, because of the midterm that's going to open up today, I'll, I'll open it up tonight before I go home. Should be open by five. Okay. So the midterm will open up tonight as, as well as quiz four. Okay. So the midterm will open up and that'll be open until Monday night at 1159. So you guys will have like however many days that is four or five days to get that done. I'm just going to kind of tell you, it'll be probably one of the easiest midterms you've ever taken in your life. Okay. Not intended to be difficult, really, really at all. Okay. So, um, so there's that. So be looking, that will open up uh, here in the next few hours. So before we jump into today, um, let's actually review. Okay, let's actually review from last time. So let's go back over just some of the things we learned on Tuesday to make sure that we're that things are sticking, that we're cementing concepts. Okay. Um, okay. So let's actually start here. Um, a a a woman who is, for example. She is, let's say she's grab it a three, pair of two. What does that mean? Grab it a three, pair of two. What does that mean? Yeah. You've got it. Bingo. Um, yep. Okay. So if, um, what does it mean when a woman has a radical hysterectomy? What, what, what's involved there? What structures are actually taken out uh, with that procedure? Okay, that and what else? So there, there, there's a complete hysterectomy, which is removal of the uterus. Oh, wait. But there's also a radical one, which is just which is the uterus, but then other organs as well. So there's two more that get taken out. So it's an ophorectomy along with the stoppingectomy. So what does that mean? Oh, blowing up the chat to me. Yep, I'm a nice job on that one. Um, so we're taking out, remember, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries with that one as well. And I can go back and show you that if needed. Um, okay, so let's say, for example, um, if I have nephrolithiasis, nephrolithiasis, what do I have? Who can tell me? Nephrolithiasis. Bingo. Nice job, Dalton. Okay. Um, okay. Let's say that I am a, I am a little boy, and I was I was born with hypospadia. Do you guys remember what hypospadia is? We talked about that a couple times actually on Tuesday. What's hypospadia? So give you a hint. It has to do with the with with the urethra. Okay, what, what happens there? Who remembers what happens there? So remember, oh, I'm sorry, I knew I didn't see that. Correct, yeah, so, so the urethral opens actually not at the front of the glands because it's actually on the bottom of the top. But then you actually go in, and what, so if, if they're surgically reconstructing the urethra, what do we call that? Bingo, yep. Nice job. <clears throat> do we do we do? There we go. Okay. All right. Let's let's go a little bit. No, let's let's go a little further here. What about? Okay. What about? Um, let's say I am a I'm, I'm a young young male and I have crypt organism. What is crypt organism? Oh, be mine. Just can tell me what that is. So we talked about digging. Correct, undescended, right? Yeah. And generally speaking, right, when, as a part of our development, where does that, where does that typically develop as, as kids? Where does it tend to live when we're developing? Yeah, you guys can all tell me the all raise your hand. I'm not kidding, okay. And Amelia, so what happens then as we get older? Or if it doesn't happen. Okay, what's that surgery called? Okay, orchio. So we remember that the, the word for testicle is orchio. 
or or get up, right? Or test them, right? But surgical fixation is pexy, so we have an orchiopexy. Okay. All right. Cool. All right. Let's throw in a couple from the heart and lungs, just for good measure. Okay, to kind of jog our memory a little bit more. All right. So if I have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, who can explain to me what that is? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Explain what that is. Yeah. Over the ground heart muscles. Okay. Good. Generally speaking, what side? Yeah. Generally speaking, which ventricle are we most concerned with? It's okay. It's okay. That was that was kind of a kind of curveball there. But yeah, it's the left ventricle. So if we remember from our A and P, right, the left ventricle goes out into the, into the systemic circulation. So any blood pushed out of the heart from the left ventricle goes out into the obviously uh, extremities, right, trunk, those types of things. It's oxygenated, so it goes out in the extremities so it can be used. Pretty cool. Okay. Um, if I am looking into, if I have an instrument like a scope and I am looking into someone's bronchus with that scope, what am I doing? And for those of you that are dropping answers into the chat, thank you so much. What am I doing? Egan, you're on a roll, man. Got him. Bronchoscopy. Nice job. Okay. Good. Wonderful. Fantastic. Here we go. So let's get into the content for today. Lymphatic system. Yippee skippy. Okay. Um, what? Let's change that. Weird. There we go. That's better. Okay. Um, so the lymphatic system. I never get this pointer to work either, so we'll see how that goes. So guys, just real quick, uh, Zoom, Zoom folks, when I step away from the microphone, like over here, can y'all still hear me? Just want to make sure that it's not like going in and out. Wonderful. Awesome. Just want to make sure that we don't have any issues. I want you guys to make sure that you catch all of this. Okay, cool. Okay, so we talked about um, the lymphatic system. <laughs> it's not, it's not gonna happen today. It's a lymph, the, the lymphatic system. So if you guys remember, right? If you remember from Tuesday, we spent, we spent time, actually no, this was last week. We spent a lot of time talking about the vascular system, particularly the capillaries, right? Uh, with the arterioles and the venules and the capillary bed, where a lot of our gas exchange occurs, right? Uh, and a lot of our nutrient exchange occurs. Now, here's the deal though, right? There we go. Okay, right along, right also inside of those capillary beds are lymphatic capillaries as well, okay? So what happens here, right, is that we have fluid right? It's being pushed out of the capillary beds into the tissue, so into the tissue space. And what essentially happens here is we develop a pressure gradient, okay? Um, and so essentially we have increased pressure uh, from the vasculature into the tissue, okay, with a lower amount of pressure, okay, in the lymphatic capillaries. So what happens is because of that, that difference in pressure, okay, we then send that, that, that fluid that tissue fluid, particularly that tissue fluid that has like proteins and cell debris and, and things inside of it into the lymph capillary itself, right? So what do we call fluid once it gets inside of a lymph vessel? What's it called? It's called lymph. So any fluid inside of a lymph vessel is called lymph, okay? Um, and so we're, we'll talk about also too how the lymphatic system is actually also complemented heavily um, by the spleen and the thymus. And we'll talk about kind of the specific role, right, of those organs and what it is that they actually do, right? Um, in, uh, in, in basically in general um, uh, defense and immune function uh, itself, uh, itself, okay? All right. So when we talk about lymph, right, how exactly, 
how exactly does the lymph move in the body? Okay, so ultimately, as we talked about, right, it starts in those lymphatic capillaries, the capillary that, right, due to the pressure gradient, and that fluid actually being essentially pushed into uh, both the lymphatic and venous system. Okay, now it goes into the into the lymphatic vessels, and then essentially uh, from there it goes to the lymph nodes. Okay, the lymph nodes is actually where a lot of the uh, tissue debris and foreign particles are actually, actually removed. We're going to talk about that just briefly here on the next slide. Okay, and then obviously after that fluid has been cycled through the lymph nodes, um, it goes into the collecting duct. We have a right, uh, a right collecting duct and then a left thoracic duct. They're actually called two different names because they're in the same position, right? And then uh, into the lymphatic vessel near the subclavian vein to be put back into venous circulation. Okay, so any time that we have a blockage in any one of these areas, we actually can develop edema, right? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. So anytime we have a blockage here, we can actually develop edema. So here, here are some examples, right, of edema. So the first one is one that I know that my athletic training students are familiar with. We see this all the time, right? Edema and ankylosis after an ankle sprain. Okay, very common. We see it a lot, right? So obviously we can see not only the not only the edema right in the ankle, but also the discoloration. Right, so the, the, the bruising there, which is honestly a result of some myoglobin that's been uh, kind, of, kind of escaped into, into the tissue space because there are also some muscular injuries that happen with the vast majority of ankle sprains. Okay, and then we can see off to the far right. Okay, we have another patient here with lymphedema, but it looks a little different, right? So generally speaking, there wasn't necessarily uh, an acute injury here, but the patient has a very edematous or you know a limb that's filled with edema, a little bit of redness there as well, right? Um, and so... Definitely two very different pictures of edema, but we can definitely see that the common factor between the two of them is that is that fluid has accumulated within that tissue space. Okay. Okay. So, what exactly, guys? What exactly happens at a lymph node? Okay, it's just crazy. Um, maybe not, but it's it's pretty cool nonetheless, right? So, a lymph node itself has many functional units inside of it, and one of those functional units of a lymph node is called a lymph nodule. Okay, so inside of that, inside of that lymph nodule, there actually are these reservoirs of rapidly dividing white blood cells. Okay, lymphocytes and those types of things. Now, here's the deal. What they do, okay, generally speaking, is they will essentially attack uh, and engulf the, uh, the, the pathogen or the foreign particle, um, whether it's tissue debris or what have you, right? And then and you can actually see um, this kind of cross section of a lymph node. You can see that we have, you know, at least in this picture, at least three afferent lymph vessels. So if you if you remember from A and P, like with our with our nervous system, we have afferent neurons and efferent neurons. Okay, the, the afferent neurons are those that actually move up towards the, the brain, the spinal cord and brain, and the efferent are those that move away from the spinal cord and brain. So if you remember E efferent exit, you know it goes away from the spinal cord. Okay. Now obviously. After that debris or that pathogen is digested uh, in the lymph node, it's actually uh, put back out into the efferent uh, lymph vessel and back up the uh, into the into the lymph vessel itself, uh, back towards the collecting duct uh, into the <coughs> circulation. Bless you. Okay, this is the coolest thing ever, right? So if you ever spend time, if you've ever tried this, right? We have basically concentrations of lymph nodes all throughout the body. And this is, this is actually really, um, a really cool thing to do, right? So we have, so we have obviously lymph nodes that actually are kind of really, really kind of concentrated at the neck, both the front and the back, also at the armpits and axilla, so in the armpits and then breast tissue, right? And then also, yeah, cool. Um, do the slides aren't working for the mic. Oh, shoot. Are you guys not seeing these guys? Yeah, that's you guys are like in the chat, like. We can't see anything. All right, hang on. Let me thank you, Kool Aid. Let, let me fix that. Let me see what I can do. Oh, we had this issue last time too. Um, stop. So, what are you guys seeing in front of you right now? If you don't mind me asking, do you see any slides? We just see the lymphatic system slide, like the first slide. Just the title. Okay. All right. Duplicate, let's try that. Okay, tell me what you see now. Tell me what you see now.
Yep. Emma, yep. Do you guys, do you guys see, uh, there should be now I, um, in front of you a slide with some lymph nodes, right? A picture of a head. Yay. Got them. Yep. That's right. Okay. Thanks guys. Sorry about that. But now, now, now you've got it. Okay. Sweet. Okay, so like we talked about, right? We've got lymph nodes actually in various concentrations throughout the body. So we obviously in the neck, axillae, right? Breast tissue, uh, and then also in the groin, okay? Um, are, very, are very common spots. Now, excuse me. If you, if you ever take the time to actually kind of try and palpate these, they're actually, when you are otherwise healthy, you shouldn't necessarily be able to feel these, right? But in someone who is sick, you will definitely be able to feel them. Okay, so how do you do that? It can be really tricky to actually feel them, but if you take the pads of your fingers, that can be super gentle too, by the way, you can't press like crazy hard. So take, you can just take your fingers, find the anterior triangle in your neck, which is right here, and just drop those fingers right in. Right. And, you, and if you're otherwise healthy, you're probably not gonna feel much at all, okay? Okay, then, okay, that's the anterior chain. Now, in the event, there are times when you can actually feel on a patient, uh, basically enlarged nodes at the posterior chain, which is back here. So there's actually one, uh, one viral uh, syndrome that we see quite often um, in clinical practice that actually presents with inflammation of both the anterior and the posterior chain, okay? Does anyone have an idea of what it might be? Very common. You can just guess. I mean, like I said, judgment free zone. There's, there's no right or wrong answer here. We're just learning together. So, what? Flu. Flu. Very close. Very close. But extremely common on college campuses mono. Okay, mononucleosis. Crazy though. Now, not, you know, I, I don't know, but it's interesting to me. It seems like there's actually been less particularly because of the, of the prevalence of COVID on a lot of campuses right now, there's actually probably, the, probably been a lot less as far as the uh, incidents as far as mono and other things. It's been pretty COVID heavy, obviously. Um, but, you know, uh, mono actually can present with uh, posterior chain lymphadenopathy. Okay, so the neck will be very sore, won't really be very kind of soft and supple, and you'll notice the posterior chain lymphadenopathy back here, usually. Okay, um, so conversely, okay, you can also see uh, the, these uh, lymphatics actually also inflamed, also in the groin. It happens also in the groin. So we had a, I had a patient a few years ago, uh, came in to saw me because he was very concerned about uh, kind of, you know, an issue with, with the front, with the anterior aspect of his hip, right? Thought he, he thought he might have had a hernia, but you lay him down on the table and you just kind of, just, you know, kind of basically just gently palpating. And as you run your fingers across the kind of the anterior thigh on this guy, you could definitely feel that there were kind of some raised kind of lymph nodes under the skin. Okay, so remember, as we talked about, it doesn't take a ton of pressure to be able to palpate these. Very, very light touch, and you can pick it up. Real light touch. Okay. All right. Okay. So, guys, the thymus. What in the world, right? So I feel like in a lot of anatomy classes, the thymus kind of gets brushed over a lot of the time. You might learn a little bit about it, but it's never, it's not really ever covered in depth, right? So um, for those of you who have had AMP, which I'm assuming is the vast majority of you in here, right? Um, as I'm sure you know, obviously as, as babies and as little kids, Our thymus glands are actually pretty big, right? They're, they're pretty large. But as we get older, particularly as we get into adulthood, um, the, the thymus gland actually shrinks in size. It's a lot smaller. However, okay, when we talk about the role of the thymus and what it actually does, its main job, okay, is to act as a reservoir for, blood, for white blood cells and to provide a site for differentiation from undifferentiated uh, white blood cells to T lymphocytes, mainly, okay? So that's the role of the thymus. Um, and as we're gonna talk about in a minute, those T lymphocytes actually have a very specific role um, in the immune response, okay? 
And if there are any questions, guys, please stop me. All right, excuse me, spleen. Okay, so the spleen is another thing that I feel like um, we, don't res we don't really give it the respect that it deserves. The spleen is an incredibly important organ, incredibly vital, particularly uh, within you know, the, the immune response itself. So the spleen contains essentially these venous sinuses. And when I say sinus, I'm talking about like a depression, right, with, within the organ itself. And along that depression, essentially, it's lined with these with what's called red pulp and white pulp. Okay, what that is is a descriptor for the cell content of that site. Okay, so red pulp is generally a large concentration of red blood cells or erythrocytes in the area. Okay, and as a matter of fact, there's so many uh, in that area that it actually gives the spleen its color. Believe it or not. Okay, um, and then conversely, we also have white pulp, and white pulp is you know, you're going to find it in these small islands. You, you see the slide uh, here. You actually can see a lot of different areas of red pulp. And then it kind of starting to first out here, these little islands of white pulp as well. Okay. And that is actually where the lymphocytes are. Okay. In the white pulp, they are actually also um, dispersed from there in the event that they are needed to fight a pathogen. Okay. So cruising through this. Um, Okay, so obviously, guys, when we talk about defense, okay, when we talk about our ability to fight off uh, not only pathogens, but also, uh, you know, uh, any other type of foreign debris, right? Even if it's after an injury, right? We're going to we're going to divide that response into something that is either non-specific or specific. Okay, so we have very we have essentially these very generalized responses, um, such as becoming febrile, developing a fever. Right? Those are all things that we do as part of a non-specific uh, defense mechanism, right, or response. Um, so, for example, you know, also the skin. We have the skin as well, which is the largest organ in the body. As we learned last week, creates the, basically the, the largest organ for defense and protection in the external environment. Okay. So, one thing that we did um, this morning, actually, in in classes, we actually did a little, a little exercise, um, and it was you know, it was kind of goofy, but at the same time, maybe arguably arguably a little bit fun, maybe. So there are actually specialized uh, proteins, right, uh, that are, that have a role in the in the defense response. Okay, we have these essentially collectives, defenses, and interferons. Okay, now here's the deal: what they do is these are actually uh, proteins and peptides that actually basically sit inside of a receptor in the event that a, a pathogen or any type of a foreign body is present okay, in order to attempt to prevent that pathogen from entering or attaching to a host cell. Okay, so what, what we're going to do, okay, like I said, kind of goofy, but I want everybody to close your eyes and make any shape you want with your hand, any shape whatsoever. And I want you to set it on the top of your head. Okay, goofy, it's you know, obviously a little bit childish, but this is going to make sense in a minute. So here's the deal if I am a defensive or if I am an interferon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find any receptor to block, okay, from that pathogen, and I'm going to just drop right into it. Okay, however, in the event of a specific response, where I am actually concerned with the combination of an antibody and an, and an antigen, I have to be able to match that surface protein exactly in a complementary fashion. So if I come back to the UV, I don't know what shape this is, we're, we're gonna make this work, right? And I come in and I match it like perfectly and I fit right in there. That's, that's a specific response. Okay, lock and key, just like that. Okay, we're done. Thanks for playing. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Okay. All right. So clearly, within those specific responses as well, okay, like we talked about, we have you know very specific roles, obviously in both T cells and B cells. So the T cell is actually a little bit different in the way that it engages with the pathogen. The T cell itself actually uh, will will confront the pathogen head on and actually uh, engulf it via phagocytosis. 
However, what's different is that a B cell won't exactly engage the pathogen like head on. It'll actually, it'll actually divide and multiply and then develop it and, and then develop an antibody. Okay, against the pathogen, send that antibody out and then fight the pathogen that way. So that is actually how T cells and B cells differ. So these, as, as the B cell develops those pathogens, uh, there, there's a, a group of them that are called amino, aminoglobulins. Okay, and you can see the, 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 one, the ones we have listed down here um, at the bottom of the screen. So we have obviously, I, and these are different types of aminoglobulins, amino, immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, okay, IgM, IgD, and IgE. Okay, excuse me. So, for example, just an example of this is if we have somebody that has anaphylaxis, okay, and they have an IgE mediated response. Okay, a way that I remember that is. E, 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 it itches, right? Uh, so it's an eosinophilic reaction, right? Okay. And so ultimately, in these types of situations, we would use an over-the-counter medication like Benadryl and or like in some cases, epinephrine. Um, so we had a, uh, whoever who here has ever seen, and I know Dalton, you probably have, uh, have you ever seen a case of anaphylaxis? Oh, yeah. Okay. So ultimately with anaphylaxis, who, who knows a little bit about anaphylaxis and what it does? Maddie, tell me about anaphylaxis. Well, it's happened to me. Uh, mm. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know uh, that was okay. Tell me. Yeah. So when I found out that I was allergic to shrimp, I ate shrimp, and I went into anaphylaxis from Daddy the Benadryl. Um, and then the twist is, I was actually in China at the time, so they don't really have urgent. Care. No. And they okay. also don't really have people who are allergic to shrimp. So it was a very like, panicky situation for my parents. Yeah. Um, so I just took the Benadryl and then um, urgent care. Well, they didn't have like hospitals open at the time. So we had to wait like the next day for okay. business hours to actually get like a more specific kind of medication and sure like, <coughs> the next <one. coughs> okay okay um so you took benadryl did the benadryl help mm -hmm. okay so generally speaking right now what exactly when when you were in the middle of your anaphylactic episode what did you what were you feeling um well i first it started like my throat felt funny mm -hmm. um I don't know how to describe it. it. Just felt like there was definitely something wrong. Um, and then there, my dad said like sores started to develop inside yeah. of my mouth. Yeah. Um, and then it got really serious and like I couldn't breathe. <laughs> and then that's when like I took the Benadryl. Yeah. That was also my first time swallowing a pill. <laughs> so yeah. it was a lot of like little things that could have gone wrong, but yeah. it wasn't that bad. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's actually, that's actually a really cool, um, cool story. I'm sorry that happened. Now, that, that's a yeah. very, it's a very informative story actually for what we're talking about. Um, so uh, I've seen anaphylaxis, you know, in, 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 in my practice previously. Um, and a young man that was actually uh, really, really allergic to wasps uh, got stung and comes in to the athletic training clinic uh, where, where I was. And I was actually I was actually just there talking with one of my staff members about, about an administrative thing. And this young man comes in, okay, full blown, full blown IgG related response, okay? Walks in, his eyes are swollen shut. You can hear him wheezing, okay? And his, he's actually, he's actually almost kind of like just copious amounts of saliva coming out of his mouth. Nose just like running profusely. And you can hear him wheezing and he's just like, has to essentially go and he's bent over a trash can because it's almost kind of like he's blowing his nose constantly and he's having extreme difficulty breathing, right? Run around, he run around the eyes and everything like that. So we got some, we, we gave him some intermuscular epinephrine and got him to a hospital, right? And we were able to kind of get him calmed down. So epinephrine is kind of the, the next step after Benadryl. If we don't really have any success, then we can give that obviously intermuscularly um, through an epipen, right? Um, and then if we don't have any success with that, we can actually um, send them to have that done uh, intravenously uh, through some, through, uh, you know, at, at the ED. So cool story. 
All right, friends, word pairs. Let's talk about some words. Okay, super fun. So uh, a lot of this I'm, is probably very self-explanatory. Whoops, whoops. Sorry, got ahead of myself. Um, okay, lymph, lymph or lympho. Okay, that's the root for lymph. Okay, spleno. Okay, root for spleen. Okay, plasmoplasm, thymo, thymus. Okay, cyto is cell. Okay, so here, here's a question for you guys. Let's say that you have a patient, you're seeing a patient and you do blood work on them. And let's say you do a CBC, you do a complete blood count and it comes back to you and they and their, 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 their white count is down. Okay, so using the terms that we have up here, what would, what would we say that they are? If they have a cell count that might be low, what do we call them? They're what? Can you say that again? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so we do, we, we do a CBC, comes back, they have, they, they have a low white count, okay? So they're what? A low white blood cell count? Yeah, they're... Yeah, but generally speaking, we would call them what? So what's what's the suffix for few or small number of? Yeah. Okay, penia, right? So they so they would be cytopenic. Or you got, yeah, I see you guys shaking your heads. You're like, we knew that. We just, yeah, just throw it out there, right? Cytopenic and or specifically, if we're looking at white blood cells, they have leukocytopenia, okay? Or they're, they're leukocytopenic, okay? So leuco meaning white, cyto meaning cell, penic meaning few, okay? Cool. All right. So what if, what if we're going to throw out the term, okay, hematopoiesis? What does that mean? Hematopoiesis. What do we think? What, what do we think that is? Okay, one, one more time. A creation of cells. Yeah, creation of uh, really of red, of red blood cells and white blood cells. Where does that take place? The bone marrow. Yep, absolutely. Okay, nice. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, check it out. So I know you like, I always include this, excuse me, at least in the lectures that I write, I always include this, this slide about coding. They're like, wait, who cares about coding? Well, it's important, right? So, whoops, shoot, let me minimize that. Um, this is where we actually have to do a little bit of thinking, right? So if we have a patient, for example, that comes in and they're presenting with, you know, symptoms that are probably, you know, they, they have a symptom of, maybe they have some lymphadenopathy, or, okay, or, you know, maybe they have a generalized lymphedema, right? There are a lot of things that can cause that type of presentation, right? So what, what I'm telling you is that usually, usually these things are actually secondary to another type of pathology or disease. For example, okay, someone who is, you know, who maybe has, <coughs> you know, who has a, uh, thrombocytopenic purpura, you know, purpura or some other blood disorder, right? May present with lymphadenopathy. Conversely, what about someone who has cancer? Okay, they have cancer and they're being treated for cancer. All right, maybe they're having radiation or chemotherapy. Okay, now, particularly, okay, what, you know, and, and, and this is absolutely true. If you see a patient that has cancer, okay, they will present with lymphadenopathy, particularly if they're currently in treatment. Why do you think that would make sense? Why? If it makes sense to you, why does it make sense to you? I sure can, absolutely. So if we have a patient, okay, and that patient has cancer and they're being treated either with chemotherapy or radiation, Okay, you're guaranteed that they're, that they're going to have lymphadenopathy. Okay, you're going to notice that on them when they come to see you. Okay, so 
If you're like, oh, that makes sense. That would make sense why that would be the case. Tell me why that makes sense, if it does. If it doesn't, I'll explain. You're like, wait, big fat zero, man. You're not prepared to do that. Explain that, please. No, big fat blank, man. Okay, here's the deal. Um, so obviously, with the, with the introduction of like chemotherapy or radiation, okay, what are, what are we doing? Okay, we are actually introducing a foreign substance into the body, right? One that is not, and, and even, I mean, even, even by virtue of having cancer without treatment, okay? They, they ultimately are identifying a cell that is not their own. So ultimately the body's immune system will, will respond, okay? Will essentially uh, gravitate to that cell, identify it and attempt to destroy it, okay? Now, here's the deal, okay? Ultimately that process Okay, as so it's got to result in lymphadenopathy. Why? Because that tissue debris, that lymph that is there, is being circulated through, through the lymphatic system, right? The same thing if they're having they have chemo, right? We're utilizing essentially uh, a chemotactic drug right, and attempting to essentially kill that cancer. Same thing with radiation. So those are those are all right, non-organic substances to the human body that are being introduced that the body will try to fight off if it can. Okay. All right. Yep. That, so hopefully that makes sense. So other things, right? Other things, as we already talked about, somebody might have lymphadenopathy or lymphedema secondary to mononucleosis, right? Or congestive heart failure. Okay. Other things that can cause lymphadenopathy, right? So they, they have a lot, of, a lot of tissue fluid because it's not getting back toward the heart, right? Not uncommon to see some lymphadenopathy there. Makes sense, right? Okay. And then obviously, uh, other things, okay, trauma um, can cause mortality. Uh, not uncommon, actually, in people that have passed away to see actually a little bit um, of lymphadenopathy and even, uh, you know, a little bit of edema at least at first um, before the mortis sets in. So that also can be the case. Um, and then obviously, down here in the bottom code, so Z00 through Z99. Uh, you know, that's any other reason that someone who will be coming to see you, like for a vaccination or for a flu shot, for COVID vaccine, right? Any, any of those things, right? So those are all things that you would utilize to keep within uh, this system or this coding set. If that makes sense. Okay. All right. Moving right along. So we have about an hour. Here's what we're going to do, okay? I know that this kind of gets monotonous. So let's actually take a 10-minute break. Let's get up and move around, take a break, and we'll come back in 10 minutes, and then we'll knock out the digestive system, okay? Any questions at all? I know we kind of flew through that a little bit, but was that, did that make sense? Okay, cool. All right, well, let's take a break. You guys can get up, move around, do what you need to do. We'll be back, be back in 10 minutes, and we'll finish up. Okay, Emma, Justine, Alex, Danielle, you guys doing okay? Lovely. Okay, cool. All right. I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. Okay. If you need anything, let me know. No, no. So I'm I'm actually an athletic trainer. That's that's my background. So I I, I teach in the athletic training program here at the states. Um, so I teach classes in basically in uh, orthopedic examination and rehab. It's kind of my kind of my my jam. Um, and so yeah, I teach. Uh, I just got done teaching uh, athletic training techniques too, where we talk a lot about kind of shoulder, elbow, wrist, and fingers. Uh, you know, examination and rehab, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I had, I had a, a lot of basically generalized primary care experience too, just kind of working in the college setting because I saw everything, not just like, you know, injuries, but also people that were sick. 
Um, so I just I just picked up a lot of stuff. I'm also old and bald, so that also influences a lot. So. Do we do we do? Oh, shoot. How's uh, J-Term going for you guys? You guys doing okay? You guys like super stressed out or no? No, that's good. Thank you. For how many of you guys is this the only class you have? None of you? Everybody's taking more than one? Okay, so it's crazy. Like I've actually never been at a school 
where JTERM was a thing, actually. First, yeah, so it was new, new to me, actually. So, but I guess it definitely helps you guys graduate on time. Potentially, maybe that's kind of the purpose. So what do you guys think of this class so far? So, so, yeah, okay, I'm good, I'm glad. At least it's not horrible, at least, at least from what you'll tell me while you're here, but we'll see how it ends. Okay, cool. Just want to make sure that I had everybody's name down. All right, sweet. Okay, I think everybody's back. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you guys see my screen, Zoom folks? Wonderful, beautiful. Okay, good deal. All right, friends. So, digestive tract. Okay. Um, so before we actually start this, I need to. I need to actually. I'm going to share with you guys a, a dad joke from this morning that was actually pretty fantastic if dad jokes are your thing. So I have two, okay? First one is, how do you cut the ocean? Yes! Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you know the answer. That, that's my favorite joke in the world. How do you cut the ocean with a seesaw? Anyway, <laughs> it's pretty great. I can see Dalton like smiling back there. Okay, cool. Here's another one. How many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? Ten. Tentacles. <laughs> okay, moving on. All right. That was fun while it lasted, but here we go. The digestive tract. Okay, friends, here we go. So when we talk about the digestive tract, okay, it's going to be most, I mean, really for our purposes in this class, it's going to be most instructive for us to break this down into basically two parts. Okay, knowing that the digestive tract essentially covers the alimentary canal, which is essentially the canal from the mouth all the way to the anus, right? Which is where we chew, our, where, from where we chew the food, obviously, and uh, you know, start the digestive process to where we end the digestive process, okay? And obviously also breaking it down into, the, into its accessory uh, organs as well. Salivary glands, uh, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, okay, as well. So, obviously just kind of going through, obviously the, the alimentary canal, Begins with the mouth and teeth, where the food is essentially ground and moistened. Uh, obviously, it uh, begin, it enters the upper GI tract through the pharynx, um, through the throat. Um, obviously, the food is further moistened there, and then goes into the esophagus, which is essentially just a straight tube where the food passes essentially straight down into the stomach. We're going to talk about all these organs in a little bit more detail as we kind of move through. Okay, 
uh, obviously the small intestine, uh, the large intestine, and then the anal canal. Okay, so when we talk about the accessory implants, though, it's the salivary glands, liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. They all have they all have a very specific contribution uh, to the to the digestive process, and we'll talk about uh, those in um, some some level of detail, uh, but while still kind of remaining basic. Okay. Okay, so check it out. Here it is essentially a cross section of the alimentary canal. Okay, it's broken down essentially into four layers and I'll explain these, okay? So this is the first one that we can see this, this most inner layer is the mucosa, okay? This is actually the, the canal where the, where the food actually passes through, okay? Above that, we have the submucosa that's actually, obviously the time vascularized and also has lymph tissue inside of it. Um, there, are, there are actually specialized uh, lymph uh, tissue inside of the intestine uh, that actually digests and transport fat. So you can see here that obviously uh, within the alimentary canal, we have two, two layers of muscle. We have one muscular layer, but the muscle itself is actually striated, striated so it's, there's a, a uh, basically a uh, basically striated lung musculature and then a circular muscle, right? For that digestive process to occur. And who knows the term, by the way, for the digestive process as a whole, what's it called? If we're digesting, we have what? What's that, what's that term called? It's a catch-all term for digestion what, for, and rhythmic contraction of the alimentary canal. Peristalsis. peristalsis. Bingo. Okay. And, okay. What's the opposite of peristalsis? Kind of more of a little, kind of a, kind of a joke, but not. Right? So reverse, reverse peristalsis or emesis, where you throw up. Right? Okay. Okay, so here's the deal. You might be, you, you may be asking yourself, what is this yellow layer right here on top of the muscle? So actually, if we look at the anatomy, right, of, uh, of the, the belly itself, we actually do have two layers of fat that actually essentially kind of encase the internal organs. We have the greater, the greater and lesser omentum, um, also called uh, the, the greater and lesser mesentery in some books, right? And so those are actually a kind of a combination of fat and dense connective tissue that essentially hold uh, the, the muscular contents inside uh, of, the, of the abdominal cavity. Um, and you can see, obviously, also then we have the serosa, uh, which is the, the most outer layer of the organ itself. Okay. The esophagus. Okay, the esophagus is basically a long muscular tube. The inside of the esophagus is lined with mucus glands, uh, which keep the esophagus essentially. Uh, nice and moist to allow food to pass to pass through, okay, from the parents to the stomach. The esophagus is essentially 10 inches long. Um, so now here's the deal, okay? When the esophagus passes into the, the abdominal cavity, it has to penetrate the diaphragm. Okay, it goes through the diaphragm. There is actually a very specific anatomical structure called the esophageal hiatus. Okay, the esophageal hiatus is where the esophagus uh, penetrates the diaphragm and goes into the abdominal cavity. Now, there are there, there is actually a, a, a specific condition where the esophagus and or uh, the, uh, the fundus of the stomach, a portion of the fundus of the stomach actually protrudes through the, through the uh, esophageal hiatus, and that is termed a, a hiatal hernia, okay? So it's obviously, if you were to break down that medical term, hiatal pertaining to the hiatus hernia, okay? Um, so you're actually going to, people will, that actually complain of that will notice symptoms right here in the epigastric region up here and you'll feel kind of an, an appreciable lump. Okay. Um, also not uncommon. And we'll talk more about that in a minute for those to present as, for those to present as umbilical hernias as well. I actually have one. You can actually help you feel mine right here. It's a little, little tiny piece of uh, organ, maybe even a little bit of transverse dominance kind of pooching through my, my rectus down here. So anyway, that's fun. Okay, the stomach. Here we go, guys. So the stomach obviously, you know, is actually broken down into four parts. So it actually starts up here. Here in the esophagus. This is actually the cardiac portion of the stomach. Okay, then we have the fundus, the body, and then the pylorus of the stomach down here. Okay, so four separate regions of the stomach. Um, so the stomach actually, the stomach actually does not get the attention that it deserves, right? The stomach is actually more complex than we think. 
Um, obviously, you know, a basic function of the stomach is that, <laughs> excuse me, is that it contains hydrochloric acid so that we can digest food. And there's much more to it than that. Okay. But another thing that we don't really pay much attention to when we talk about the stomach is the presence of hormones, right? Like leptin and ghrelin, those types of things that actually regulate hunger. So there's actually been an increased focus uh, recently, particularly in the area of bariatric surgery, right? Where we talk a lot about uh, the presence of these hormones, either their lack, uh, you know, their, their lack or their presence that actually kind of stimulates uh, the appetite, right? Is there potentially a connection between the level of these hormones uh, in people that are overweight or obese and their desire for food, right? Is it actually something that happens? So it's something that's kind of definitely ongoing and, and being studied, um, but the stomach is definitely, and there, we're, we're, we're getting a lot more momentum as far as understanding you know, the, the complexity of the organ itself and what it does. Toward the, here in just a little bit, we're, we're gonna talk about actually a whole nother class of, of diseases that are actually starting to kind of uh, become categorized known as disorders of the, of the brain gut axis. It's crazy interesting stuff. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so as far as, as far as the secretion, right, um, of these hormones. So if you guys remember, right, when we talk about the internal organs, uh, we, are, we are generally speaking of the autonomic nervous system, okay? And that is the nervous system that is, that is under unconscious control. So here's my question for you guys. Let's see what you remember from a &P. Okay, and you guys are probably gonna knock this out of the park because this is not, not, not a hard question. What type, okay, what type of, of neurological activity upregulates the autonomic nervous system? You guys are smart people, so I know you know this. What type of, what type of, uh, of neurological activity upregulates the autonomic nervous system? Sorry, I'm minimizing this for a second, guys. I'm just checking the chat. Nothing in the chat. I'm gonna make sure I don't miss anything. Whoa. What do we think? What type of what, what type of activity? So there's so there's two. There's there's parasympathetic and sympathetic. What type of activity upregulates the autonomic system? Excuse me. Okay, so that would be oh oh shoot. Danielle for the win. Thank you so much, Danielle. Great, nice answer. I love it. Okay, the parasympathetic nervous system actually upregulates the autonomic nervous system. Now, here's an example of that, okay? Here's an example of that, okay? All of us, okay, we've, all of us have gone out to work out, whether we've gone for a run or whatever, right? Get up in the morning, feeling great, you have your breakfast, and then you go out for a nice little stroll, all right? Now, here's the deal. You've eaten, okay, you have abdominal contents, right? Um, but while you're working out, you don't necessarily feel the need to go to the bathroom. That is because the sympathetic activity, right, from your nervous system is, you know, actually is down-regulating or depressing your autonomic nervous system function, okay? And then when you stop exercising, okay, the autonomic nervous system kind of kicks back on as that paras parasympathetic stimulation kicks back in, and those abdominal contents, those stomach contents drop into the, um, into the colon, and then you feel like you have to go to the bathroom, okay? Kind of a gross example, but that's just something, it's, it, that's a way to remember that, right? That's an example of kind of helping you kind of put that together, okay? So, um, obviously, um, from a kind, of a kind of a chemical mediator hormone standpoint, um, so we have somatostatin, and that suppresses the secretion of gastric juice, uh, of which hydrochloric acid is a part, uh, and that's a sympathetic function, right? And then we have acetylcholine, which is which increases that secretion uh, of, of gastric juice. Okay, and that's parasympathetic regulation. Cool. Fun times, small intestine. Okay, so this is crazy. I kind of this picture is kind of cool. Okay, so here's the here's the small intestine. Okay, if you look real close. Okay, so you can actually see, you know, obviously the abdomen is open. You can see the surgeon actually holding the, the small intestine in his hands um, right here. But if you look really, really close at this, you can actually see a, a yellow sheet back here. And that's actually the omentum, okay, kind of connecting the small intestine there, okay? Um, but here's the deal. 
And if you look, if you look real close, you can actually see these little circular muscular rings in the small intestine. Crazy cool. But the small intestine itself is divided into three parts. At the very top, we have a duodenum. Okay. Duodenum at the top. Duodenum is actually uh, kind of very tightly kind of um, kind of confluent okay, with, with the visceral and parietal pleura of the abdomen. So it's, it's kind of kind of tight in the kind of the upper double cavity. Whereas, okay, the jejunum and the ileum, which are the other two sections, middle and lower, of the small intestine, okay, actually have less of a connection to the pleura and therefore are a little bit more kind of kind of freely moving inside the abdominal cavity. Um, but ultimately, right, the job of the of the small intestine is to ob obviously absorb, nut absorb nutrients and aid in digestion, right? And so this is actually where a lot of the work occurs. But as we talked about, okay, we actually cannot adequately digest food particles without the contribution of uh, obviously um, acids and, and uh, I hate this term because it, it's just, oh, this is government go after class and get some pancreatic juice. That's, no, you don't, why, why call it that? Like, that's just, I feel like that's kind of unnecessary, right? You know, yes, Matthew's shaking his head. He's like, yeah, I'm not, why? I'm not going to go buy a pancreatic, like, pancreatic juice at the store. No, okay, <laughs> kind of gross. But, okay, as you can see, the pancreas actually has two ducts that open up into the small intestine, right? And from these ducts, we have actually the secretion of, pan of pancreatic amylase, okay, and lipase. So this is where we break down obviously carbohydrates and fats. Not only that, but we also have uh, the breakdown of proteins here uh, through trypsin, okay, and chymotrypsin. Um, and ultimately through those things, we're actually able to further break down food um, and obviously take in minerals um, from the small intestine. So here's the deal though. And I, I asked this question and this is, you guys, you guys are all like, I know all of you know, this, this is like a really simple question, but what, what's, What's the disease that can be caused uh, and or can be that can really kind of, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it's caused by um, kind of altered function of the pancreas. What's one disease caused by, caused by altered function of the pancreas? Yeah, yeah, it's a big one. Absolutely, right? It's a big one. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. What's another huge one? Another huge one. Yeah, Izzy, diabetes, absolutely, absolutely. So Izzy, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna quiz you a little more, okay? So tell me, if, uh, what's the difference between type one and type two? Right, absolutely. So yeah, and absolutely, yeah. And so also with type two, um, you know, because of the, uh, of the amount of sugar that you ingest, the insulin that you do secrete obviously becomes less effective, you know? And so, yeah, ex excellent. Um, okay. But let's go back. So Dalton, Dal Dalton talked talk a little bit about, a little bit about pancreatitis. So let's think about this for a second. What happens if one of these ducts actually gets clogged and we're starting to produce, okay, this pancreatic juice, and it just kind of sits kind of at the head of the pancreas, right? And actually doesn't get secreted into the small intestine. Ultimately, what will happen here is that we'll get the breakdown of the pancreas. Ultimately, uh, a little bit of that will be digested. And that actually can result in, a, in acute pancreatitis, okay, which is extremely painful. It, and hopefully, I wish, hopefully none of you have ever experienced that. But from the people that I know that have had it, it's zero fun. Absolutely zero fun. It's, it's, it's excruciating. Okay. The liver. Okay. The liver's got a huge job, guys. So not only does the liver help us obviously with things like making cholesterol and other things, but it's also extremely important in the regulation of glucose and metabolism, right? So what, what, uh, what compound, what sugar is the parent of glucose? The parent of glucose, who would, what would that be? Who are we thinking? Glucose is broken down from this. Yep. Glycogen. Bingo. Okay. And what, what breaks it down? 
So I think Izzy, I saw your hand kind of going up over there. Maybe, maybe that's what I saw. Maybe not. Okay. All right. What breaks down glycogen into glucose? Okay. Glucagon. Okay, glucagon. Whoa. We got an answer now. Okay. And so, Danielle, yeah. So, the insulin there, ultimately, remember what the insulin is going to do is the insulin is actually going to essentially uh, assist us with transport of the, of the glucose into the cell for use, for creation of ATP, right? Um, so, but yes. So, nice job. Okay. All right. So, clearly, here's another thing. All right. Anytime that we talk about the liver, we also need to talk about obviously the composition of fat, right? And how the liver actually helps us deposit fat from the diet and the adipocytes in the tissue, right? You know, and so ultimately though, there can be a time and there can be uh, instances in which, that, in which that process actually runs afoul and we start to actually accumulate fat within the liver itself. Okay, and then we develop a disease, a disease state known as steatohepatitis, appetitis, okay, also known as fatty liver disease, okay? I'll tell you guys a story. Um, from my practice actually. Um, so when I was when I was a practicing athletic trainer at, at, at a university, uh, probably in, over the course of two seasons, we had probably two or three different linemen. We had one defensive lineman and two offensive linemen that actually came in to see me with abdominal pain, right? Well, after further workup, we were actually able to determine that, that these, these, these guys, they're 20, 21, 22 years old, had fatty liver disease, okay? How in the world can it be, right, that guys that are presumably healthy work out for like two hours a day, go to practice, eat, eat well, quote, you know, quotation fingers, right, end up with fatty liver disease? Well, you know, it happened. And ultimately, they, they weren't actually eating all that well. Uh, they were eating really high, kind of really high fat, high carb diets. However, right, um, and this kind of begs the question, there's actually been research uh, that's been done that... And this is actually kind of a case series from the NFL. It's several years old, but they looked at the rate of metabolic syndrome, uh, which is essentially the combination of, hyper, of uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, fatty liver, right, and obesity, um, and offensive linemen. And they found that a good number, at least, I think at least almost half of offensive linemen in the NFL met the criteria for metabolic syndrome. Okay, and these are these are people that we generally regard as being in very very good health because they're athletes. I mean, usually that's the one you think of, right? However, and this kind of, this is, this kind of begs the question. So I remember um, there was, there was an offensive lineman that, uh, that went, that was, that played where I used to work and great guy, but he finished playing, graduated his senior year and completely and totally changed course, committed himself to doing like, you know, so many minutes of, of aerobic activity a day. Right. I remember later going to the grocery store and he, he worked there walking past him and not even recognizing him because he had lost 150 pounds. The guy, I mean, the guy was like, I'm not a big guy. And he was like smaller than me. Okay. So ultimately that begs the question for those of you that are going to be taking care of, you know, potentially active people, athletes, right? The question that we need to ask ourselves is the weight that someone has on them or the body that someone has on them when they're active as an athlete. Right, case in point, a football player, a lot of mass, okay, fat and muscle. Is that the body type over time that's going to lead them to have optimal health for the rest of their life? And I think we find the answer to that, honestly, is probably is no in a lot of cases. You know, so my brother, for example, uh, played football in high school and stopped playing and kept eating like he did when he was playing and gained like a, like a ton of weight. Right. And so ultimately, it's kind of an instructive point that you're seeing people that are, that are highly active. You may need to keep that in mind. OK. All right. OK, let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about bile. So obviously, bile is a, is a byproduct um, of the breakdown of red blood cells. Right. And it's constantly being secreted by the liver. <laughs> So bile actually contains a combination of salts, okay, cholesterol, and bile, bile pigments, uh, specifically bilirubin and bilirubin. 
um, and electrolytes. Okay, now here's the deal. When we are essentially, when we are you know, between meals or uh, other times actually excess bile is stored in the gallbladder, okay? Because excess bile is stored in the gallbladder, the walls of the gallbladder at times can take on really, really high concentrations of salt and really high concentrations of cholesterol. Sometimes, okay, that cholesterol can actually harden, all right? And we develop these little, these little crystals um, that can actually obstruct uh, both the hepatic bile duct and or the common bile duct, right? And this is where we get the term gallstones, all right? This is, this is actually how this happens. Um, and we're gonna learn a term in a minute. So we have the you know, obstruction of the, of, of the bile duct from the liver. We have cholecystitis. And then we have the common bile duct, cholidoco cystitis. And we'll talk about that in a second, okay? Um, so those are zero fun. Okay, large, in large intestine. Excuse me. So here's the deal. The large intestine is actually composed mainly of mucous cells, right? So as far as absorption of nutrients, with the exception of water and electrolytes, there's not entirely a huge role uh, for that for digestion of vitamin of vitamins and minerals uh, and food contents within the large intestine, typically relegated to fluids uh, and, and solids in the form of electrolytes. Okay. Now here's the deal. Within within the uh, Within the large intestine, we also have bacterial flora, okay? And does anybody know what I, what I mean when I say bacterial flora or gut flora? What's, what, what's an example of gut flora? What, what do I mean when I say that? Okay, so, the, so within the large intestine, Okay, we have bacteria that actually naturally exist on the mucosal wall of the large intestine. Not every time, I leave that out. Um, well, okay, cool. So we have, uh, we, you know, so we have these, these bacterial flora that exist, right? That help us kind of maintain that bacterial balance. So there's actually consequences like yeah, bingo, absolutely. Okay, I love it. That, 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 that's exactly where I was going. So let's talk about for a second. Okay, I'm just gonna throw this out there. The consequences of diarrhea, okay? It's kind of a great lead in, but okay, diarrhea itself. Okay, do we think that someone that has diarrhea, would they have an increase or a decrease in their bacterial flora? What do we think? Decrease, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so obviously as that excess fluid that's not being absorbed in the, in the large intestine uh, makes its way to the gut, those bacterial flora are being flushed out, right? Obviously, every time we go to the bathroom, okay? Now, um, you know, ultimately, and one of the things that I found that works really well for treating diarrhea, and it's super simple, right? So we give we give the patient an antidiarrheal, okay, like, a, uh, like an emodium or, you know, something like that, or, or, or a loperamide to calm that down. And then we just tell them that then the next goal is to reestablish the gut flora. Okay, help them kind of get that balance back. How do we do that? So they can take like octobacillus, like what you know, tell them to spread up, right? The other thing too can be really simple. You know, tell them, hey, you know, I know that maybe this is not your thing, but go to the store and grab some yogurt. And just eat, just eat a couple of yogurts for the next few days. And that'll, that'll really kind of balance out that, that biome in your gut. And I'll prevent this with the boring. So let's talk about one more thing that's actually super important that all of you are going to have to know at some point. Uh, okay. Let's say that somebody goes into the hospital. Let's say they have pneumonia. Okay. They have pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia, and not good. So they're put on IV antibiotics in the hospital. Um, excuse me. And as a result, okay, the, the pneumonia eventually clears up. But we start to notice in this patient over the course of a few days, they start to develop abdominal pain, bloating, and diarrhea. Okay. Now, this is actually really common, and you guys are going to see this. You guys are going to see this uh, when when you're working someday. Okay. A very common concern, uh, and actually, who can tell me what is the concern for someone who's been on kind of longer term antibiotics, particularly in regards to gut flora? What can that put them at risk of? 
It's a very specific condition. Like I said, this is a judgment-free zone, so if you if you know it, shout it out. It's okay. What do you think? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Who has heard of Clostridium, Clostridium difficile or C. diff? Okay. Yeah, you guys are shaking your heads now. Okay. What do you know about C. diff? Tell me what you know about C. diff. No? Okay. Dalton? The infection in the digestive tract is fairly common. Fairly common. Okay. Yeah. So ultimately what happens is you can develop actually, you can, you can develop Clostridium difficile or C. diff uh, from excessive antibiotic use. Okay. Um, so essentially what happens is, is it actually, uh, the, the bacteria essentially completely and totally eliminates your gut flora. Um, and then you can actually pick up C. diff uh, after prolonged exposure to antibiotics. So um, amazingly enough, your gut flora are actually what help you fight off C. diff in the first place. So it's actually really important to kind of reestablish that, uh, the, the gut biome as well, okay? Nice. Okay, some terms, friends. Terms, terms, terms. Um, okay, so obviously, you know, uh, abdomino, cilio, or lapro, that means abdomen, okay? An or ano means anus, okay? Antra was the antrum of the stomach, and that's actually at the uh, bottom portion near the uh, near the opening to the uh, duodenum. Okay, the antrum. Okay, appendigo. Okay, that's pertaining to the appendix. Okay, it's obviously pretty self-explanatory. Okay, uh, seco, cecum. Okay, uh, colo, colon. Okay, dento. Okay, tooth, duodeno, duodenum. Okay, obviously don't need to continue to read these off. You guys, you guys got it. Okay. Um, pretty self-explanatory. All right, um, a few more, okay. Uh, Kalo, okay, lip, cholangio, bile duct, colodoco, common bile duct, okay, gingivo, gum, okay, glossa or, ling or, or lingulo, tongue, or lingual actually, sorry, hepato, uh, liver, palato, pancreato, uh, obviously, uh, peritoneo, peritoneum, pyloro, pylorus, pertaining to that uh, bottom portion of the stomach, okay, cialo, and uvulo. All right. Okay, so a little bit, a little bit more discussion here. This is going to be super, kind of maybe kind of fun, okay? Um, obviously, uh, diverticulo, okay, these are actually pouches that form along the intestine. Um, so what happens is these are actually out pouchings. Um, along the uh, along the wall of the intestine that actually form from lack of dietary fiber, right? The problem here, though, is that you can get food particles and sometimes fecal matter uh, inside of these little pouches, and they can get infected, all right? Then you'll have what's known as a diverticular flare. Uh, generally speaking, these are treated with antibiotics. However, uh, in the event that you've had quite a few flares within a given time period, uh, it's, it's possible that you may need to go in for a bowel resection, uh, depending on the opinion of your gastroenterologist, right? They want you to, to go in and get, a, get that portion of the bowel with those diverticula taken out. Okay. Um, okay. So a prefix here, hemi, okay, means half. Okay. Uh, and then obviously, so, hmm, well, that's, that, that's for later. But, uh, and then obviously, pepsia, suffix for digestion. Okay. If someone has dyspepsia, what, what, what do we think they have? Dyspepsia. What do we think that means? Ian. Okay, very good. Okay, so dyspepsia, yep. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> other words to know, friends. Okay, so we actually talked about this already a little bit. Uh, Scout hepatitis, fatty liver disease. <clears throat> okay, sleep gastrectomy. This is actually one of the most common uh, forms of weight loss surgery uh, performed today. Uh, there are others, obviously. Uh, there's like a ruin Y procedure and others, but sleep gastrectomy is, is one of the most common. Uh, anorexia nervosa, okay, uh, characterized by psychosocial, psychosocial symptoms, including uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, inability or unwillingness to intake food, um, 
and obviously bulimia characterized by a clinical pattern of binging, of binging and purging, uh, cirrhosis, okay, Crohn's disease, um, duodenal ulcer, which is essentially an ulcer located in the duodenum, okay, of the small intestine, uh, gastric, gastric ulcers, okay, this next one is a term you guys are going to hear all the time, GERD, okay, gastrointestinal, uh, sorry, gastroesophageal reflux disease, okay, GERD. Um, so here's the deal. So I kind of told you guys that there's actually kind of this new branch, right? <clears throat> Within gastroenterology that's actually emerging. And people are actually starting to explore uh, these disorders known as disorders of the brain gut axis, right? So what they've actually found is that in people, for example, that maybe they have, uh, you know, high level kind of unrelenting constipation, or maybe we have people that have ir like IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. What they've actually started to kind of notice in these people is that as they're talking to them, one of the things that they're noticing is that many of these patients uh, that have these GI symptoms that are not going away, uh, if you talk to them, you'll actually find that they have some, that in the vast majority of them, there is some sort of cycle, there's some sort of event psychologically and or a trauma that they experience. Um, that they, you know, have had a hard time coming to grips with and, and processing, right? That has led them to actually a lot of uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. So, uh, and it goes also way beyond that, but there's actually, it's, it's kind of cool. So there's actually this kind of emerging school of thought that um, we actually uh, might start understanding like a lot of these chronic bowel diseases um, by kind of looking a little bit more at, at the brain gut axis and kind of the, the relationship between those two things. So pretty pretty cool stuff. Um, you know what, I totally skipped something that I was gonna talk about. So that got like 15 minutes will be done long before that. So, um, okay, so we talked about, I, I had on the slide actually a couple slides ago. Um, excuse me, um, there you go. So different types of hernias, right? So we talked about um, a little bit, right? The different types of hernias like hiatal hernias, <coughs> umbilical hernias, right? Uh, femoral hernias and inguinal hernias. We didn't really go over those so much, but on a, on a basic level, right? <clears throat> who can tell me, golly, who can tell me what is, what is a, a kind of a, a classic hernia? What, what's the definition of that? What would that be? What happens when someone has a hernia? What do we think? Okay, yeah. So you have basically um, essentially intestine and or deep abdominal muscle that can actually protrude uh, through that tear. Whoop. Um, so, oh, okay. So Mary, that's actually a good answer. Well, we're actually going to talk about that um, on next Thursday, actually. So we'll get into that a little bit. Um, good, good. Like, I like that though, but we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, okay. So there are different places where these can actually occur. So we talked about, remember the hiatal hernia actually happening up here at the esophageal hiatus. Okay. And you'll actually notice that when these patients are complaining of this, they're going to have kind of a nice kind of palpable like lump right here in the epigastric region. Okay. Um, okay. So umbilical hernia is actually, I actually, I actually have one of these myself. So earlier today, by the way, it was super funny. I, I was talking about this and I said that I had a, I have a hernia or a, an umbilical hernia. And one of my students who was sitting right there, I look up and I look at his face and he's like this. He's like, he was like super concerned. He was like, we'll get that checked out right now. He was like, he was very worried for me. I was like, it's going to be okay. He had to be there, but it was super funny. You could have just seen his face. Um, okay. All right. So umbilical hernia. Obviously, we also have two types of hernias that can also occur below the inguinal ligament, right? So we have, I have my inguinal canal here in the front of me, okay? Now, the abdominal content can also come down through the inguinal canal and kind of be, kind of, kind of poke out of the inguinal canal, okay? That's called an inguinal hernia, okay? Now, conversely though, okay, the inguinal hernia, the, the, the abdominal contents can actually also kind of come out anteriorly 
to the inguinal hernia actually at the level of the groin. Okay, and that's actually called a femoral hernia. So different types of hernias. Um, one thing though that you guys are definitely gonna see that you need to be aware of is, and I'll, I'll kind of redraw this. Um, there is actually, there's actually a condition um, called diastasis recti. Okay, for those of you that have not seen this, the first time that you see it, you will not forget what it looks like. I promise. Okay, so ultimately, in people that are in that, then people that are in shape, uh, quotation fingers have abs, right? You'll see their, their rectus here. And there it is. Nice muscular rectus. All right. Like I said, mine doesn't look like that. It looks like this. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, but here's the deal. The line, okay, the line down the middle of the rectus is called the linea alba. Okay. When particularly, okay, uh, for a lot of our women who are having children, uh, they will have a tear in the linea alba that will actually cause the rectus to separate laterally. So it'll go like this. It'll just pop open. Right. So ultimately, yeah, you can look, you're, you're like super interested in this. I can tell your face. You're like, yes, tell me more. Right. So with, with diastasis recti, okay. The rectus actually almost kind of splits in half. And what you notice, okay. When these people kind of sit up is that the transverse abdominis will actually kind of poke through that opening. And it looks like they have an alien popping out of their belly. <sighs> Crazy. Okay. Obviously that's not what it is. But, okay, something to be aware of. Um, also not uncommon um, in men who are getting older, maybe approaching, you know, late 40s, early 50s. You can definitely see that, particularly as men get older. We tend to have this problem. Um, so, yeah, um, so, but it's, it's something that when you see it, you won't ever forget it. Um, for, for a lot of our ladies, too, um, it, it, can make, it can make people feel insecure. Right, it's just kind of self-conscious. So, you know, there's therapy for that kind of thing, you can try, uh, but then it, it can be repaired surgically. You can go see a general surgeon and they might be able to help you with it. Do you have a question, No. Okay. All right. Um, so we are done actually about 10 minutes early. Cool times. So here's the, here's the thing. Okay, like I said, uh, if you're soon, okay, quiz four is gonna pop up. You guys will also see the midterm, I'll, I'll have that open here uh, very, very soon, okay? Um, so if you're looking for that, you will have until Monday night at 11.59 to knock that out, okay? So if you if you reviewed your terms and you've taken the quizzes, I don't expect that this is going to be any type of difficult for you at all. I expect that you're probably just going to crush it, all right? So um, any questions? You guys need anything? Any thoughts, comments, concerns, questions? No? Man, okay. Well, you guys have a great rest of your Thursday. And I will see you guys on Tuesday. All right. Any questions from you guys on the Zoom? It's just me. I just had a question regarding. Nope. Okay. Um, all right, guys, I will see you guys on Thursday. No, false, Tuesday. Yep. 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 You too, again. Can you hear me? Well, what you were talking about with the view, yeah. is there anything besides surgery that can like, help you come back? For the, um, the diastasis directly? Yeah. Yes. Um, so almost like you can try, so like you can, you can actually try physical therapy sometimes. Okay. So you kind of try to work on like your deep core, mm -hmm. because ultimately the, the problem is that the transition dominance actually deep to the rectus actually stretches out as a result of childbirth, and it just kind of pops right through. So if you can, if you can retrain it, 
right, and get it to kind of fire again. It's possible that you can maybe make some progress. However, the big, the big issue though, is still the fact that the rectus is actually separated this way. And that's really hard to get that to actually come back together. Does that happen with like all childbirths? Not, just... not, well, it happens with, with a lot of them, but not all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. If you need anything, let me know. All right. Sorry, Mary. Um, bye, guys. Yeah. All right, Mary. Hang on. Ah. You too. Sneak away. Okay, Mary, can you hear me? Maybe not? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. What's going on? I was just asking, um, just so like if I'm getting it right, so could I do a condition called glaucoma? Absolutely. You can, Mary, you can pick any pathology that you want. It could be anything you want. So then like regarding the template and stuff, it's just basic, like the first part is kind of, getting a general story of what like the patient came in and then talking about their condition. Yep. That history and then for so and then the other stuff we would kind of just find based off what we research or like yeah yeah absolutely. So the other sections, right? Um so like the obviously physical exam and assessment, um what would you typically and you said you were doing glaucoma, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So ultimately, what would then, what would a physical exam look like in somebody with glaucoma, right? That would be something, and then, you know, just basically just a, a normal exam that would be typical of a, of, a, of a glaucoma patient, right? What would you expect to find in that situation? Okay. Right? Okay. Um, and then radiographic laboratory study. So if they like got samples or something or. Yeah. So um, there are, so with glaucoma specifically, it's really fun. It's, it's kind of interesting that you bring this up because I'm I'm actually a, a glaucoma suspect. Um, I don't have glaucoma, but I am I'm a suspect for it. Um, one of the things they often do for glaucoma is they actually do what's called visual field testing. Um, so that's something you may want to Google or look up, uh, at least in regards to how glaucoma is diagnosed through visual field testing. Then um, going using. Because I'm kind of confused and or not understanding with the coding aspect of the kind of the course. So only because I know like at the end of each presentation, there's like the coding that would be generally used. So is that just used instead of using the name of the condition? It's just like shorter. Okay, so Mary, that's actually that's actually a great question. So let me let me actually explain that a little bit more in a little bit more detail. Um, so any time in clinical practice that you, <laughs> that you write a note or you have a patient encounter that you're hoping to get reimbursed for as a provider, <laughs> excuse me, the insurance company will want to know, right? Not only what your clinical diagnosis is in, you know, kind of in writing, but it will be expected that in addition to that diagnosis, that you also include um, diagnosis codes uh, for the insurance company. So that will be required no matter what you do. So in your situation, how would you apply that? So you would pull up, you know, uh, icd10data.com, you go on the website, and you'd actually look up the codes for disorders of the eye, right? And after you make your assessment being glaucoma, right, you would then include the diagnostic codes for glaucoma. Would that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so, but what does, what do those codes then help with? Sure. Good question. So th those codes do two things. Okay. Those codes determine uh, not only kind of what the insurance company, uh, like what the diagnosis is that they will pay for so that they can track the disease, but they will also determine your potential level of reimbursement for that visit. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Reimbursement. So because I know like when I shout out the PT, like I know that she, so like on her reports and stuff, she had an ad code and I just like talking to them, they always said like, 
when they basically the reports are so like patients can get treated and also so yep. that the um, doctor can get paid. Yep, that's pretty much what it is. Okay, that makes sense. okay. I'm sorry that that wasn't more clear to begin with. No, it's okay. I just like I I like I see it, but then I kind of get confused because it's just like there. So I'm not sure like what to do with it. Sure, I understand that. Okay, that's that's all my questions. Thank you. You're very welcome. Have a good day. Okay. okay.